name is Jason Palfritz, Executive Vice President of Corporate Services for OTC Markets Group. Uh, we've been a proud sponsor of, of LD Micro for a number of years now. Hopefully, because of that, most of you know who we are. For those of you that don't, uh, we are the market on which about, on our top markets, around 1,400 small and micro cap companies are publicly traded. Um, our mission has always been to make being public less painful. Um, part of that mandate um, with the creation of Reg A Plus has been helping companies that are now able to use, the cap, use Reg A in a way that's more meaningful um, figure out what to do for the secondary trading environment of those securities. Um, so I'm pleased and honored to be joined uh, by Bill Lee, who's the CEO of Nightscope, uh, a company that is availing itself of uh, the new Reg A Plus regulation, and we're going to have a little bit of a chat about his company, answer questions around uh, that you might have around Reg A Plus, and just talk about the genesis of, of the company and why at this moment Reg A Plus is a good opportunity for capital raising. Again, there's a lot of people that know about Reg A Plus, there's a lot of people that don't. Uh, we'll have questions at the end. Uh, we're going to start with a short video and then we'll go a little more into that. So just to lay the groundwork for, for Bill's company, we thought it best to, to show you this little video. Imagine if we could just save one single life. That technology would be absolutely priceless. In an end city in America, my motto is life is short, do what you love, and make a massive impact. Nightscope's in the business of solving problems. And what greater problem to solve than crime? I believe the future is providing security professionals really smart engineers for them to be able to do their jobs much more effectively, utilizing autonomous robots. This is where innovation plays a massive role to change the rules of the game. We have the whole principle of software plus hardware plus human, so you have to have the human element involved. As a security guard, one has the ability to access all of that information right at their fingertips and at a moment's notice and in real time. The Nightscope technologies combined with humans is a solution, and it's a solution that's already making an impact today. A violent crime occurs every 27 seconds in America, a property crime every four seconds, and a gun is stolen every single minute of the day. You take that trillion dollar negative economic impact on the U.S. economy every single year and we cut it in half. What happens? You put a marked police car in an area where there's a high portion of crime, criminal behavior immediately changes in those situations. Same thing with the robot. Having that presence there is absolutely critical. That psychological deterrence in addition to that physical presence, I think we've got a, a game-changing opportunity. So between the previous presentation about hacking and this one about crime and violence, this is the fun part of LD Micro. I hope you guys are all really upbeat. So I guess the first question, Bill, what was the genesis for you to start this company? You know, you, you touched on it a little bit in the video, but you know, what really has just driven you to, to create the company and what do you like us to know that we kind of didn't get out of the video? Well, first of all, good evening and thanks for having us. Uh, both personal and professional drive. On the professional side, I'm an ex-Ford Motor Company executive. Uh, I think autonomous technology and self-driving vehicles are going to turn the world completely upside down. Um, I think the path that all the major players are taking, uh, it's going to take 5, 10, 15 years to actually commercialize that technology. Uh, because we operate less than 25 miles an hour on private roads, we don't have any regulatory framework, insurance framework, or legal framework that we need to wait for. So we've actually commercialized that technology last year. Uh, and while people are still doing science projects, we actually have uh, these machines operating in over uh, a dozen, nearly a dozen locations across the state of California. 
Um, so we're going to take a very unique path to commercializing uh, autonomous motion. Uh, on the personal side, I uh, was born in New York City, so when I hit my time on 9-11, I'm still pretty pissed off about it. And so the rest of my life, I'm dedicating to better securing our country. So he didn't know that, but I was also born in New York City. So what are the odds you get two born and raised New Yorkers on the panel? Too trouble. So I mean, really, we're talking. You know, part of this is, is Reggae Plus, and Reggae Plus is definitely about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. Um, so as you built this company, kind of, what have been your your things you didn't anticipate, kind of blockers that things you wish you had known, and then kind of the greatest achievement, the thing that makes you most proud uh, as you going through this process? Uh, so financing this is not easy. Um, so you've got, depending on the day, I don't know, 10,000 VCs doling out $50 billion uh, a year into thousands and thousands of startups. 90 plus percent of them, most of the GPs at these firms are ex-software people. So you go pitch something like this, it's like, okay, so this is a really difficult problem. Oh no, this is not going work. This, I mean, the first year was hard. So the company's three and a half years old. Uh, in 2013, we started trying to raise money, and uh, well, first of all, you know, physical security is not an investment thesis. Period. We don't have, you know, enterprise, uh, business to consumer, and there's not like the physical security bucket, right? Uh, second, uh, this is way too complicated. It's software plus hardware, and you know, you need to pick one. Uh, three, we only need 15 million dollars to build the first one. Right? And on and on and on and on. So we did what most good entrepreneurs do. We just ignore everybody and go do what we said we were going to do. Uh, so we've raised $14 million of capital, million of capital thus far. Uh, the cap table is very focused on long-term, evergreen, balance sheet-driven money. So we've got four corporates and a bunch of family offices and, and private investors and no traditional VCs, even though we're literally in the, in the heart of uh, Silicon Valley. So that I didn't, I didn't expect that, but... Um, this will be interesting once we do this reggae offering, what happens. Uh, proudest achievement thus far, I can't name the client, but uh, we have one particular client that for the last six weeks, or, or prior to us showing up, um, had a theft uh, or some criminal incident twice a week at their facilities. Literally twice a week something bad is happening. Uh, it's a 24-7 kind of operation. Uh, we deployed the technology six weeks ago, and the number is down to Zero. So I think we're on to something. Yeah, it's impressive. So now, now to the funding portion of the evening. So you decided you've raised fourteen million. Yep. Um, clearly, you're going to need a lot more to continue to grow. You decided um, certainly one of the ways to finance the company is, is through Reg A plus. So what kind of brought you to that moment? What about the new regulation uh, interested you? Why have you made the decision? And what do you hope to achieve, I guess? I'm a corporate officer, and I have fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders, which I take very seriously. And part of it is cost of capital. A lot of entrepreneurs spend a lot of time trying to do product market fit, uh, especially in Silicon Valley. But not a lot of people end up spending time being thoughtful about kind of investor to company fit. What is it that you're actually trying to match up here? Um, and then for us, you know, dumping in a, a hedge fund that's looking for an 18 month out is like, that's not a good fit for us. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, I think August, we decided to go test the waters, I guess, which is the opposite of the quiet period uh, for Reg A+. Plus. And uh, from yesterday, I think we had $66 million of interest from over 2,000 uh, people. So um, we decided to proceed with filing with the SEC and uh, happy to announce tonight that uh, we actually started taking uh, reservations for shares uh, today. Uh, if you go to nightscope.com, you can start that process. Uh, we are certainly not going to be taking anywhere near the $66 million of interest, um, but we're certainly flattered about the, about the uh, interest in, in what Nightscope's doing. So I guess to set the stage a little, for those of you who don't know, uh, Regulation A+, plus, or what we'll call Title IV of the Jobs Act, uh, recently passed through Congress, went effective about a year ago. Um, really was one of those few bipartisan pieces of legislation that passed, that had unanimous support, and that really was designed to help small businesses. Um, I guess some of the main parts of it are, A, it allows uh, non-SEC reporting companies, so that's, you have to have a clear distinction. You can't already be an SEC registrant. 
although we've petitioned the SEC to include SEC reporting companies. But it allows those companies to raise up to $50 million. Um, it allows you to do it on the internet, in essence, so there's no um, quiet period. You can generally solicit to anybody, so it's not just for accredited investors. And those shares are immediately um, available for secondary trading. So those of you that might be familiar with Reg D, that's for um, really quibs or accredited investors. There's a one-year lockup. It's a more of a private placement mechanism. This is, in essence, the democratization of finance. You can IPO your company or you can raise capital using the internet um, and you can make that widely available to anybody. So it is, it is revolutionary and really you're talking about uh, your customers, the people that believe in what you're doing as an entrepreneur or as a, as a new business, those people can now become investors. Where traditionally in the IPO process, you're really going out to the large institutions and their interest in your company might not be the same interest as, as your customers. So as you've gone through this process, what have you kind of learned? What has been like your takeaways? What's working in Reg A Plus? And what do you sit there and scratch your head and say, this seemed like a great concept, but I wish I had kind of thought a little more about this or, or that. Um, it's time consuming, it's costly. Um, I strongly advise for companies that are not yet mature enough, or it's, I don't want to say amateur hour, but you haven't got your house in order, not a good idea. You know, this is, um, you, you have to have, make sure that you can actually pass through a, a pretty stringent, you know, a broker dealer is involved here, so you actually have to get you know, through them and uh, a good level of, uh, of diligence. So you need to you know, make sure your financial models are in order, you've got your, um, all your insurance policies, you've been through an audit, you know, all that good stuff, and you know, like a stepping stone to actually being a, a fully uh, publicly traded uh, uh, company. Uh, it takes time. Um, I would not shortcut the dollars. Um, some people think like, ah, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll flip this, we'll put this on, and you know, 50 grand, we're going to get you know a good offering out the door. You're an order magnitude off. Um, strongly advise you get very good, you know, outside legal counsel. In our case, we doubled up, so we got someone that's uh, been through the Reg A Plus process, kind of more on the security side of things. Uh, Wilson Sincini's counsel for us on the corporate side. And then our broker-dealer has their own in-house corporate counsel, so we try to be uh, kind of buttoned up and do this properly. So when looking at the cost, there's been a lot of talk, and you said it's costly, uh, but looking at it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a traditional IPO, did you explore that route? Were there cost differences or reasons why? Uh, well, for us, you know, we're still a young company. It probably would have been our Series C preferred, so a normal kind of Silicon Valley type of deal. Right. Um, I'm not sure it's in the best interest of the company to pay a premium for capital uh, that would come from a normal VC or institution for what we're doing. Uh, but it's appropriate for some kinds of companies, not necessarily for us. Like, if I were to come to you and go, well, this institutional investor wants uh, I don't know, a couple of board seats, uh, they have no experience in law enforcement, no experience in security, no experience in robotics, no experience in hardware. Uh, but we're going to pay a premium for their capital. And I turn around to my shareholders and go, yeah, this is, I'm doing my best fiduciary responsibility here. This is the right thing to do. That's not the right thing to do. We're trying to do something here that is uh, a little out, kind of an outlier. That's why we think we'll end up generating outlier returns. Um, and this actually impacts society. Right? This, and at the end, if you add up all the crime, as this was mentioned in the video, all the negative economic impact, you look at your social feed every morning, you see some new horrific thing happen, and I can assure you, no amount of thoughts and prayers from our political leaders are going to fix all these problems with all these shootings and everything going out. Um, if you're tired of doing that, you probably want to support an effort to try to fix this, right? Um, so trying to find that ex-military, that ex-law that law enforcement officer, that security guard, or that technologist, or that roboticist, or that police pension fund, well, you know, that's not a normal way to raise capital, but it would be the folks that would, you know, back in Wall Street, who cares? Who cares about what you're doing? And those, that's the kind of audience where people that, you know, frankly, are just tired of what's on their newsfeed. So as you look at the, at the 66 million in indicative interest, what, what's that makeup look like from an institution, from a retail, from a, a user, a customer? What? what I, I, 
kind of sleep, to be frank, all, all over the map. All over the map. All over the map. Geographically, demographically, dollar size amounts. Um, you know, I guess probably no different than when you float, uh, you follow your S1. You know, what's that whole retail makeup and institution? I mean, in a lot of cases, it's all over the map. Okay. So as the role of marketing. So in traditional IPO, you know, you're doing a road show, you're on the road, you're meeting the qualified investors, you're looking at the, you know, the big institutions, and you're kind of having those one-on-one -on -one conversations as you sell. With Reg A Plus, you're basically advertising yourself on the internet, right? Yes. So what role has, has marketing played, the video, you know, how, how much time have you had to put into that? As a way to if, sell. If, if you think you're going to raise 50 million bucks by putting some digital ads on Facebook and you know uh, on the interwebs, that's that's not going to happen. I mean, you really need to think this through. It's a very cool um, mechanism, uh, a great transaction. Uh, there's certainly going to be a, a good amount of retail traffic uh, through our broker dealer uh, through the portal. Um, but just as much time as I'm spending receiving you know, larger investors at our offices in Silicon Valley, or I'll be doing probably an actual road show, physically flying to Chicago and Miami and Dallas and New York and what have you, um, and shaking hands, and you know, people have questions. I mean, this is what we're doing is a little bit out there. Uh, the technology is also very complicated, um, and you're not going to grab that understanding of like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put in a seven-figure check based on a video and a cool website. Like, that's not, that's not reality. So I think in the end, it's going to be a, a hybrid uh, of folks that, one, understand the technology, really want to get into it, and then a whole slew of folks that a young company like us could never actually talk to. Like, when we're raising prior, you know, even before the general solicitation, like, unless I had a pre-existing relationship with you, like, I can actually talk to you about um, raising money, and now instead of going to talking to 2% of the public, we can talk to effectively 100%. Um, so I, I think it needs to be a very strong, fine balance between offline and, and, and online marketing. So when do you expect to close? What is your goal, ultimately? And what are you going to do with the money? And what's next? Never predict investor behavior. <laughs> so like, one of the things I love uh, about Reg A Plus, which some investors, some institutional investors don't like, is it allows us, as we've done our last three rounds of financing, is a rolling close. So legally, we can raise up to fifty million dollars within a twelve-month period. Um, and unlike a normal IPO, where the underwriter bought all the stuff and sells it, and then you know, escrows get released and you get all the money that the day of trading or whatever, um, this actually you act legally allowed to do closings throughout a twelve-month period. Um, so it'll be interesting. I mean, we're going to find out, right? Well, um, I think we'll, before we ask questions of the audience, kind of, is there anything else you wanted to, to mention? Anything you wanted to talk about the company? Hopes, dreams, aspirations, anecdotes, stories? Uh, sure. Well, make sure you go to nightscope.com. That's kind of really important. <laughs> um, but, you know, we'll be announcing probably later this month, there'll be a third product we're adding. So you saw in the video the K3 is uh, for indoor machines. So uh, we got one running around at the Sacramento Kings Stadium, uh, their new stadium. Uh, the K5 is primarily for outdoor use. So you know, it's at Westfield Malls, it's at Microsoft, uh, Juniper Networks, and uh, host uh, Dignity Health. You know, uh, 39 hospitals just here in, in California. Um, so that's been going well. The pipeline's looking pretty good. Uh, we're partnered with two of the uh, three largest private security companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, Securitas is a uh, um, $10 billion publicly traded, you know, 300,000 employee company. So they're the, one of our channel partners, and Allied Universals uh, privately held about 150,000 employees. Uh, so being able to scale uh, on the sales side is uh, <coughs> very important. And one of the things we've, we've learned is that K3 and K5 obviously can uh, go wherever a wheelchair can go, and our ADA compliant areas uh, kind of flat. Uh, a lot of our clients have more difficult terrain, uh, curbs, grass, sand, dirt, gravel, et cetera. So um, you'll get a sneak peek of the K7 uh, later this month. Offer it. Uh, more difficult terrain. 
Um, it's a four-wheel uh, version of what we're doing in a uh, much larger form factor, half the size of a small car. Uh, and when you see it, it'll be, uh, it's absolutely stunning. So we're excited that we'll probably get into production if all goes well by the end of 2017. Uh, so you might want to think of a, a power utility company, a solar farm, wind farm, airports. Um, you know, we've seen some horrific things out there. Uh, we have one potential incoming client that I won't name is a major airport. They've got eight miles, it's 15 years after 9 11. They guys have eight miles of unmonitored fencing. Like, all you need to do, like, no guards, no cameras, nothing. Like all you need to do is walk up there, put your sweatshirt over, sweatshirt over the barbed wire, and just jump over and you're on the tarmac. Like, really? Um, we have another incoming client, um, 3,000 substations, 75 high value targets, all naked. Like, are you just kidding me? Um, what was the other one? 1% um, of a retailer's uh, revenue leaves the, leaves the store. So you're running a $50 billion publicly traded company, a billion dollars walks out the door, either patrons or employees. I mean, at some point, I hope one day we're able to walk in there and go, you know what, the robots are free. Like, we'll take 50% of whatever we save you. Um, but, you know, this ends up, uh, probably the last point, just, well, there's a lot of financially minded folks here. You know, how does this make money? It's, okay, it's cool, it's interesting, but, you know, we're here to make some cash, so how do you do that? Um, so if you want to uh, look at the numbers globally, uh, if you add up all 200 countries around the world, spend uh, $500 billion a year on security. $500 billion a year. Uh, probably $300 billion addressable by our, what we want to do, we have planned, or our aspirations. So, you know, take 10% of that. Is over a couple of decades do we think we can build a $30 billion a year company? Yeah, probably. Um, so that, I think that's uh, certainly an opportunity. But if you look at um, the opportunity to <coughs> generate a significant amount of cash. Uh, an off-duty law enforcement officer, if you wanted him or her to stand out to the, outside the hotel here, armed, probably $90 an hour, plus or minus. Um, a mall cop or security guard is roughly, plus or minus, about $25 an hour. Okay. Um, and we have clients that spend 50, 100, 150 million dollars a year on security guards. So put that in perspective. So you walk into the CFO's office and go, hey, you're paying like 25, 28 bucks an hour. You're not really getting what you really need. You actually have to do this. Um, what if we gave you this machine here that can do 100 times more than a human could ever possibly do? Do it consistently, 24-7, day, nights, days, weekends, holidays, every single day of the year. <coughs> and it's at seven bucks an hour. Might we get your attention? So you walk into a client and you say, listen, I can give you a massive cost reduction and a security improvement and some, for some uh, brand enhancing opportunity. That's wonderful for the client, right? So you get, so we got criticized because we priced it too low. Well, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, but, okay, well, how does that, you know, impact our investors? Like, guys, you know, seven bucks an hour is kind of, for what you're showing me is you know, a lot of to swallow. Well, just do the math real quick. Seven bucks an hour, we run 24 seven, we sign year long contracts. It's basically $5,000 of revenue per machine per month. As an ex auto executive at Ford Motor Company, you'd expect me to make sure these machines last five years or 200,000 miles in service. 60 months times 5,000 bucks is $300,000 of revenue per machine over a five year period. And I can assure you our variable costs are nowhere near that number. So you're looking at a quarter million dollars worth of gross margin over a five year period. So the idea is to recover the variable cost of the machine in the first calendar year, which we can debt finance and kind of use low cost capital to do that. The second, third, fourth, fifth year, you're just printing money. And that's how you end up generating something that I believe eventually, uh, if we decide to file an S1 in the, in the far distant future, be very interesting for the street to see a tech company that actually has real revenue with real cash flow and real growth potential. That market cap is what I'm interested in. So, 
Nyscope.com to learn about the company. And actually, now with Grade A Plus, if you want to make an investment in the company, you can do the same thing on the website. So with that, I know we've got five minutes, I think. So we thought we'd take some questions from the audience. What are you going to use the money for? Uh, real quick, free use of proceeds. Uh, one is we want to get 100 to 200 machines in network in California, uh, and then go nationwide, uh, state by state, slowly. And we're very execution focused. Second is uh, some, somewhat controversial to be able to do visible and concealed uh, weapon detection, uh, which would be very helpful for some airports and high value targets. And then uh, lastly, to fund the, the K7 of the, the four wheel uh, machine. Yes. Uptime on the machines, our clients expect us 24-7, uh, and that's what we deliver. Um, so these machines run on lithium-ion batteries. So unlike your electric vehicle, you do not want to run for eight hours and then sit around waiting for them to recharge for hours on it. So the machines uh, patrol autonomously outdoors or indoors 24-7. Uh, they'll run right about two and a half, three hours. Uh, then they'll go autonomously find a charge pad, dock, charge for 10 to 20 minutes and basically take a coffee break every, every two and a half hours. Um, and we put that uh, charge pad, and we ask our clients to put that in a prominent location, because it still can do what it's supposed to be doing, it's just not moving. 90-95% um, of the times that something goes wrong, we can uh, remotely fix it. Uh, and one of our strategic investors can help us with the other 10%. The other uh, but basically, the other way to look at the company is a crazy data center, um, other than, uh, so we have software and people monitoring everything, making sure everything's working properly. Um, but uh, unlike a data center, our server is outside and they're moving. Uh, but they're generating, you know, each machine generates about 90 terabytes of data a year, so it's, it's a lot of traffic. Is there any um, competitive uh, competition from iRobot in this space? Uh, we have not seen yet a viable uh, competitor in the marketplace with actually commercially commercially available product. There are some partially funded and a few startups and a few other folks doing some R and D. There's probably you'll probably see some stuff come out in twenty seventeen. Uh, but I think uh, we've got first mover advantage. Chris, do we have time for one more question? Yes, sir. Okay. One more question. Yes sir. Yeah I've heard that with this reg A plus the SEC kind of stands down but that they kind of shifted it over to FINRA and FINRA uh, can really beat you up. Is that your experience or is that something that you... So what I instructed my uh, uh, team, my collective team of auditors and accountants and too many lawyers is quality over time. Um, so the comments that we back, got back from the SEC were, were very light uh, and we just are kind of wrapping up the, the process now so we have not had uh, difficult uh, dealings that you kind of outlined. And I don't know if that's because we focus very much on the quality of the offering circular that we put there, and so there's very little issue for people to, to take with it, uh, or they're actually uh, being a little bit more lax with the Reg A Plus, or maybe it's a combination of both. Uh, I, I don't know. So the SEC has certainly made this relatively easy. I believe you had two comments um, on your filing. Uh, we've had other issuers, I think, eight, nine, so really streamline the comment period. FINRA really comes into play in that secondary market, the aftermarket, if you will, uh, the broker dealer trying to file what's called the 211 and, and bringing the company into the, into the secondary market. Uh, FINRA's been working through some FINRA issues. They certainly, uh, they are asking more questions than they would typically uh, of a public company. I think that has more to do with this being a, a new uh, type of instrument that they're not yet familiar with. Certainly with ELIO, uh, we saw some back and forth, I think with some, some others that will, that will shrink the, the questions and the comments. So I'm being told we're done. Um, hard stop. So I'd like to thank Bill. Um, certainly if anybody has any questions for him or me, we'll, we'll be in the back. I'd like to thank Chris and his team as well.